It is an image that has been knit into our understanding of Newfoundland and Labrador history. Women in long skirts spreading codfish to dry on the flakes. They were known as the shore crew and their work was vital to the inshore cod fishery. But it wasn't always that way. The Newfoundland cod fishery began as a migratory operation in the 16th century. European men sailed here every year to catch fish. They'd arrive in the spring and leave in the fall. Very few women were involved. That changed in the late 18th century. From 1790 until 1815, Great Britain was almost continuously at war with France. The battling nations withdrew from the codfish trade. Newfoundland was left with an almost complete monopoly over the lucrative industry. Its suddenly booming economy attracted thousands of settlers from England and Ireland. Men and women who set down roots and started families. Soon, an expanding resident fishery replaced the migratory operation. Instead of relying on seasonal workers, it centered around the family unit. Generally speaking, the men worked at sea to catch the fish and the women worked on land to process it. Sometimes men also helped to cure the fish. The two groups were partners in an industry that would remain the backbone of the Newfoundland economy for generations to come. During the summer cod fishery, women devoted nearly all of their waking hours to curing fish. The work began on the stage. This was a wooden structure built close to the water. It included a platform where the men unloaded the fish from their boats and a shed where the shore crew processed the catch. The missionary William Wilson described their work in 1866. Let us now look at the labor of the shore crew. and We shall see that the labor of the females is quite as incessant and even more exhausting than the labor of the men. When the men have thrown the fish upon the stage head, it is put upon the splitting table by one of the females. The throat is now cut and the fish passed to another female who pulls off the head in the offal, drops it through the trunk hole into the water, takes out the liver, drops that into the gully, then pushes the fish across the table to the splitter who with one stroke of her knife takes out the sound bone and drops it into the water and slides the fish into a drudge barrel. The women at the splitting table have each a leather apron called a barvel which fits to the neck and covers the dress. When the drudge barrel is full, it is dragged to the upper end of the stage where the fish is taken out and salted. The mistress is generally the salter. The stage work commences in the evening as soon as the fishing boat arrives and if the put of fish is large, it will occupy the whole night. By the time the sun rose the next morning, the women were once again busy at work, this time carrying the fish from the stage to another structure that was known as the flake. Most flakes were wooden platforms built on tall poles and covered with tree boughs. But other flat surfaces could also be used, like a beach or even a roof. The women spread the fish out on the flakes to dry in the sun and the air. Once they had finished spreading the fish, the women returned to the stage to receive another batch of cod from the men and to split and to salt that catch. The work dominated the daily routine. Fish that was spread on the flakes in the morning had to be turned in the afternoon. The drying process could take weeks. Warm, dry weather was ideal and a soft breeze helped. But bad weather could mean disaster. Any sign of rain sent the women running to the flakes to cover the fish. Their skill and dedication impressed the travel writer Victoria Hayward, who visited Newfoundland and Labrador several times in the early 1900s. The amount of fish lore contained in the heads of these women with ballooning skirts is amazing. As judges of weather, they often put the weatherman to shame. Sometimes the coming cloud is entirely unseen by the mere stroller when these women began pell-mell to take in the fish. And when a fine evening says it is safe to leave the fish out all night, these careful souls may be seen turning over each fish, oilskins up, in case of a shower. The women's contribution to the fish-making process was crucial. It was their work that determined the quality of the fish that the family sold to the local merchant in the fall. If the cure was poorly done, if it didn't contain the right amount of salt and moisture, 
then the merchant wouldn't pay very much for the salt fish. Just how much the family earned depended on two things, the quantity of fish that the men caught and the quality of the cure that the women produced. Shore work occupied nearly all of a woman's time during the summer, but she still had to fit in a multitude of other responsibilities. Preparing meals was a constant chore. There were usually four large meals a day, in addition to several light snacks. They were called mug-ups. Most of the main meals consisted of fish and potatoes, which were sometimes supplemented with other foods, like salt pork or beef, pea soup with dumplings, or figgy duff. Mug-ups were lighter, a cup of tea with bread and butter, for example. There was also bread-making. It was a time-consuming and coveted skill. The women baked at least once a day, and sometimes twice. Before packaged yeast became available, women in Newfoundland and Labrador grew their own hops. They also grew vegetables. After the men dug the earth, the women removed stones from the soil. They planted the seeds and weeded the garden regularly. Most households grew cabbages and a variety of root crops. Althea Sims of Fogo Island recorded what she grew in her journal. May 28th, 1930. Sowed some potatoes. May 29th. Sowed some turnip seed. May 30th. Finished turnips and sowed carrot seed. May 31st. Raining all day. Cleared fine after tea. Sowed beet seed. These vegetables were easy to care for, preserved well, and were compatible with Newfoundland and Labrador's poor soil and cold climate. They were sowed in the spring and harvested in the fall. October 1st. Had a hail shower. Started digging potatoes. October 5th. Fine day. Flower steamer came in. Killed two ducks. October 15th. Two funerals. Took up my carrots and beets. Had one bucket each. October 16th. Fine in morning, rained in evening. Killed two ducks. October 17th. Fine and warm. Cleaned out my water barrel. Brought four turns of water. Fetching water was another laborious task that the women were responsible for. Victoria Hayward described the process. The outport well is usually situated at one end of the village and sometimes at a distance from it. And so, on Saturday afternoons, a stream of women, each carrying two buckets of water, flows along the undulating, rocky highway that is the village main street. A large hoop, in the midst of which the water carrier steps, helps to relieve the weight and keep the water from spilling as the woman steps briskly along. This method of carrying water seems to be the Newfoundlander's own invention. The water hoop is here one of the furnishings of every household. Most families also owned livestock, and the women took responsibility for the animals. They could include sheep, chickens, horses, cows, pigs, and goats. The women milked the animals, collected the eggs, and sheared the sheep. Wool was a valuable item. Although the loom is rare, the spinning wheel is not infrequently happened upon, yielding hand-laid yarn to supply the needs of the home knitter. And her needs are many, for no one seems to wear out socks like a fisherman. The knitter is, therefore, a figure by the window when the cool days denote the approach of winter. The women made other clothes, too, and they supplied their homes with blankets, mats, pillowcases, tablecloths, aprons, and a multitude of household goods. They also went berry picking every year. It was an activity that contributed much to the family income. Blueberries, partridge berries, bake apples, strawberries, raspberries, currants, they were all available in different parts of the colony. Women used these fruits to make jams and jellies and wines, and they bartered these goods for other provisions that would help the family get through the winter, like flour, margarine, and molasses. All of these tasks required varied skills that made a woman's work essential to her family's survival. <laughs>